Welcome to AMSA's webinar titled Innovative Practices in Employment Language Training for Low-Level English Learners. My name is Jennifer Cummins and I am AMSA's Settlement Language Coordinator and I will be facilitating today's webinar. We are joined today by 155 participants from immigrant settlement and language training organizations across BC who have joined us online for this learning experience. We would like to thank Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for funding this event today. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to go through some housekeeping. On the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar platform, you will find a control panel that can be expanded and collapsed by clicking the orange arrow. It is also possible to expand the features within the control panel by clicking the plus sign symbol next to the title. In the audio tab, you will have two options to listen to today's, today's audio, mics and speakers through your computer or the telephone. Clicking on the telephone fun function on the control panel will reveal a Canadian 647 number to call and an access code. Please note that long distance charges may apply if you connect to the audio through your telephone. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions at any time during the webinar using the question box or email your questions to events at amsa.org. For any technical difficulties that you may experience during today's webinar, please contact Lucy Buchanan Parker at projects at amsa.org or 604-718-2784. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our website along with any resources provided by the speakers. We will send out a notification on SETNET when they are posted. If you do not receive the weekly updates from SETNET, log on to our website and sign up for free. It's free to everyone. The AMSA team will be live tweeting today's event. Join in the conversation online, follow the event online, connect with other webinar participants, and submit questions using the hashtag AMSA events. Are you watching the webinar in a group? Tweet us or email us the photo of your group watching today's webinar. Today we will be hearing from two different organizations who will be sharing their insights and knowledge on delivering employment language training for low-level English learners. We will start the webinar today with Katie Stevenson and Carol Taylor from Dawson Creek Literacy Society who will be sharing with us how to incorporate essential skills into the CLB-based classroom and their experiences with employment language training for low-level English learners. Following that presentation, we will hear from Brian Campbell from the BC Federation of Labour Occupational Health and Safety Centres. He will give us an overview of his work his organization does to educate newcomers to Canada about health and safety issues in the workplace and experiences with training low-level English learners as well. Our first speakers today are Katie Stevenson, Lead Teacher and Settlement Services Coordinator at Dawson Creek Literacy Society, and Carol Taylor, Coordinator for Essential Skills and Adult Dogwood Programs from Dawson Creek Literacy Society. Katie Stevenson is passionate about settlement and language and thoroughly enjoys her role as Lead Teacher and Settlement Services Coordinator at the Dawson Creek Literacy Society. After earning her B.Ed. at the University of Alberta in 2004, she worked overseas teaching a variety of subjects. She returned to Canada in 2006 and settled in the Dawson Creek area where she now resides with her family. In 2013, she completed her M.A. in Adult Education and Equity Studies and completed her TESOL certificate from Acadia University in 2015. She has one course left in the Essential Skills Practitioner Certificate from Douglas College and has found it extremely helpful in her teaching practice. She currently teaches the English Language for the Workplace class as well as Beginner and Intermediate ESL at the Literacy Society. Carol Taylor has worked with the Ministry of Children and Family Services as a financial worker with the local Dawson Creek School District coordinating the Secondary School Apprenticeship Program, and for the past 15 years with Northern Lights College in the capacity of Instructor and Coordinator for Essential Skills Programs. 
Carol retired from Northern Lights College in June and is now working part-time for Dawson Creek Literacy Society, coordinating the Essential Skills and Adult Dogwood programs. She's experienced in Essential Skills, TOES assessments, and also the primary coordinator instructor on a variety of funded projects for Northern Lights Co College, such as the Work Essential Skills Inventory Profile, the Pre-Employment Workplace Essential Skills Program, the Skills Plus Project Phase 1, Workplace Essential Skills Program, and the Workplace Training Program for Retail and Tourism. So Katie and Carol, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Employment Language Webinar. We are excited to be here with all of you and would like to thank AMSA for bringing us all together this afternoon. My name is Katie Stevenson, and I am one of the instructors for the program and will be presenting today with Carol Taylor. Carol and I have been working together with Essential Skills since 2009 and most recently with the Dawson Creek Literacy Society. We hope that you find this presentation, presentation useful and informative. Perfect. So today we are going to be giving you an overview of Essential Skills and what they are. We will talk about Essential Skills and how they relate to language learning. We'll give you some tips for designing your curriculum and lessons using essential skills. We'll talk about our supported certificate attainment programs that we have here, offer some classroom tips and tools, and finish with some case studies of successful learners. Hello, this is Carol here. So what are essential skills? So essential skills provide the skills that are needed for life, at work, at home, and in the community. We use these skills constantly and often don't realize it. Go to the next slide, please. So the nine essential skills are reading text, document use, numeracy, writing, oral communication, thinking skills, working with others, computer use, and continuous learning. We are constantly using these and for low literacy learners, they need to improve these skills in order pro to progress and be successful in society. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the International Adult Liter Literacy Survey. So this is a history of the essential skills. So early in the 1990s, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development noted that in regard to concerns for economic competitiveness among mem member nations, one area that was receiving growing attention from education policymakers and analysts in a number of countries was the direct measurement of literacy levels in the labor force of industrialized countries. Just three years later, a series of reports was initiated presenting the results of the first International Adult Literacy Survey, which we call IELTS, which eventually involved 23 nations. The use of two different types of measurement methods performance tasks and self-assessments resulted in one of the more intriguing findings from the aisles. The number of adults thought to be at risk from various, for various factors of such as low employment, dependency upon welfare, poor health care, lack of civic participation, and so forth due to low literacy in each nation was much higher when the performance scales were used than when the self-assessment scale was used. For instance, in Canada, on the document scale, 18.2% of adults were assigned a level one, the lowest level of literacy based on their performance tasks. This resulted, sorry, this suggested that some 3.3 million of Canada's 18.3 million adults aged 16 to through 65 were at risk because of low literacy. We could move on to the next one, please. Thank you. The measurement system consisted of three literacy scales, reading, document and quantitative literacy. Adults in the age range from 16 through 65 were asked to perform a number of real world tasks involving printing materials and oral instruction for each of the three scales. In addition to the performance task scales used to assess literacy skills, the IELTS also created another set of scales which asked adults to provide self-assessments on their reading, writing and numeracy skills. How well does it represent the literacy abilities of adults? Well, the measurement scale for each of these literacy and numeracy skills consisted of five categories, no opinion, poor, moderate, good, and excellent. Next slide, please. The findings 
were that 42% of Canadian adults lack the basic literacy skills required for success, successful participation in our modern economy and society. Canadian immigrants have skill shortages of between 10 to 16% higher than the non-immigrant population. The majority of jobs in Canada requires at least IELTS Level 3 literacy skills, yet 43% of all students leaving Canada's high schools still do so at Level 1 and 2 skills. Some students obtain their Grade 12 diploma, but don't have the skills that the level of education implies. About 10% of high school students don't graduate. Next slide, please. So this goes on to the TAOS test, the test of workplace essential skills. So basically, we had to come up with an assessment so that we could measure the skills. So the TAOS test, or the, the test of workplace essential skills, was developed at Bow Valley College in partnership with Skill Plan BC. TAOS has been tested across Canada and is based on a sound foundation of research and testing. Over 70,000 people have written the TAOS and is currently being used in over 50 different colleges and in over a dozen companies to test and train workers. And the TAOS grew from the IELTS survey as well under the leadership of Scott Murray from Bow Valley College. Next slide, please. It was through the IELTS research that workplace literacy was defined as skills needed to perform tasks at work. The TAOS is an assessment tool that measures reading, text, numeracy, and document use. And as the, the uh, slide explains, it gives you a list here of, for reading text, the numeracy, and the document use. So reading text, it shows product information, manuals, regulations, codes, bulletin, notices, newsletters, and so on. So that is the area of measurement that the TAOS assesses. Next slide, please. So the complexity level for each occupation are different in, are a direct correlation to the TAOS results. Instructors and educators can look at the specific occupation that a student is working in or applying for to see the complexity level that they need to be at in order to be successful on the job. So I know this slide isn't very clear, but if we look at the ta for taxi driver, the complexity level for reading, document use, and numeracy are all at a level three. Once a student has taken the TAOS assessment, we are able to see their results, and if they are lower than a level three, we can provide curriculum and support them to increase them to a level three requirement for that specific occupation. However, for an ESL learner, it would be inappropriate to use the TAOS assessment as they may have high English language skills, but their reading and writing skills may be low. The following factors will also affect workplace success for ESL learners training and experience from their home country, level of specialization needed for target jobs, length of time in Canada, their language level, which is their CLB level, their essential skills, the cultural understanding and adaptation, economic conditions, and their personal challenges, which could be health, family, and culture. Next slide, please. We also know that essential skills has a huge impact on earning. So if we look at the pie chart here, we can see that essential skills has that impact on skill levels. So 30% of workers' income is linked to their level of essential skills. No other factor, including education and work experience, are as significant. Next slide, please. We also know that essential skills also plays a role with safety. Remembering that level one is the lowest level of essential skills based on the complexity levels. So if a truck driver only has a reading level one, they are 176% more likely to be involved in a workplace accident than those at level three to five. I'll hand it over to Katie. So originally, when it comes to essential skills, we were using the TAOS assessment, but soon realized that this was not appropriate for our ESL learners. So we now use the CLB and the following concordance table to determine ESL levels. Next slide, please. So you can see on this slide here um, that a CLB speaking score of five or six is the equivalent of a level one in essential skills. 
Most skilled professions require an ES essential skills level of three or higher, which correlates to a CLB score of nine plus, which as you know is very difficult for newcomers to achieve. For most immigrant clients who came in the entry level and semi-skilled category, the language barrier can be the largest essential skill gap to overcome. It should be noted that for the BCPNP, entry level and semi-skilled category, a CLB level four is the minimum required in all domains, which translates to only a level one in essential skills, which is a significant skills gap for many of our learners. Next, please. So for our program, we create a personalized learning plan that uses the results of the assessment results of self-assessments, which we have sourced online under the essential skills checklist. You can find those and print them off and use them for your learners. And we also use their career goals. We use this learner plan to help identify and create a personalized curriculum for each learner. And these resources are sometimes created by us in-house or we source them online. There's lots of great websites that we access. Learners with similar learning needs and career goals are placed into small group instruction inside our classroom. Next slide, please. We have a really wide range of participants um, and learners in our, our classes. Most of our ESL learners are at a CLB 2-3, which means we have to be quite creative in our program delivery. The majority of our learners are women, often with young children, and some of our learners are refugees. At our workplace language class, there is a child minder available across the hall in the Strong Start classroom of Chambly Elementary School. The space is given to us in kind by the local school district, and we fund our child minder through non-governmental sources of funding. We have been able to provide bus tickets for some of our learners to attend classes as well through various sources of funding. Next slide. A workplace language class is quite different from a regular CLB class. The primary difference in this classroom is that the curriculum is based on the occupations our learners would like to obtain. We use the essential skills listed in the NOC, or National Occupation Classification, to help us plan and source resources, and we group learners together if they have similar learning goals and needs. Last January, we offered a 12-week course called Office Fundamentals. Most of the learners in this program were a CLB 5 or 6 and wanted to become office assistants and work in a bank. Our instructor taught the basics of Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and using the internet. She used a projector to show each step and would sit next, with, next to students who were struggling. One of the students in that program has since gone on to Northern Lights College and is taking their office administration program. It should be noted that a typical class size for our program is about five students, allowing plenty of time for one-on-one -on -one in the classroom. Next so developing curriculum. So curriculum is very individualized for each student depending on their choice of occupation for their CLB or TAOS results. I find that user manipulatives work best with ESL learners. We also use the NOC codes, which is provides the task for each occupation in Canada. Next slide, please. We also offer a first aid and food safe course with the training. I am not a first aid instructor, but offer an introduction to first aid course prior to students taking their actual first aid course. This provides learners with the opportunity to learn the vocabulary used for first aid. I also use laminated cards with pictures of the various body parts and use a first aid book which I go through with students. The first aid vocabulary can be very complex so I provide the definition of words that learners wouldn't use in everyday life. Next slide please. So here is an example of the handout that I provide which lists the items in the first aid kit which is on the next slide. Next slide please. So we physically give them a first aid kit with everything that you see on the slide here. So they're able to feel it, they can touch it, 
and then obviously they can go revert back to the handout to see what they are called, how you pronounce the word, and we go through the vocabulary. Next slide, please. I also use the laminated pictures. So here are a, an example of some of the pictures that do actually have the words on them for ankle, arm, wrist, heart. And those words are all words that we practice. We, pronounce, we practice pronunciation of each of them, spelling. And all this is done prior to them taking the first aid course. Next slide, please. I teach the Food Safe Level 1 course, and as you may be aware, the BC Food Safe provides the exam in different languages. They provide it, and there's a list of, they're on the slide of the different languages that they do provide it in. So the PowerPoint for the course uses quite a high standard of vocabulary, so I often pause the video to explain the words that are used. And to support our learners further, our ESL learners, um, the learners are given the manual to take home prior to the course and they study and we will sit with them one-on-one -on -one reviewing the key vocabulary in the course manual prior to taking the course. During the course, Carol teaches and I sit beside our ESL learners. We use translation apps on our phones and we use those throughout the day and I use one during the test. So during the test, I sat with the ESL learners and read the test and translated questions on my phone as needed. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so now this is some of my favorite. Oh, sorry. Can you go back one more slide, please? Okay. Um, so during our teaching, we find, what well, I find in particular, pictures are a huge asset to our learners. So we'll use a variety of pictures from magazines or on the internet, from books, etc. I have had a guest employer come in to do mock interviews with my students, and I've had volunteers to come in to act as customers so that people can practice making small talk in a speed dating format. And when I say speed dating, I get quite a few giggles, and so I think I'll just explain that right now. When we do speed dating, we have the learners sitting in a small circle, and the backs of the chairs are facing one another, so the chairs are facing out. And in front of each of the learners, we place another chair, and the volunteer sits in that chair. So we set a timer, and the volunteers come in, and they just say, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so, and they practice for five minutes just making small talk. And then the timer goes, the volunteers get up and move to the right and sit down in front of the next student. So everyone moves in a circle on the outer ring. And everyone gets a chance to talk to all of the, all the students get to talk to all the different volunteers. And it's really, it's a lot of fun. You get a lot of giggles. And a lot of people don't want to move at the end of their turn. So, as mentioned, we do one-on-one -on -one support for our certificate classes. And one of my favorite things to use in the class is manipulatives. I've gone to our local McDonald's, and they have provided empty food containers, so like hamburger boxes, drink cups, so that we can use them to practice taking food orders. I also have a child, children's play car mat and some mini, mini cars and stop signs and things like that so that we can set those up on the mat in front of the learners and we can practice driving rules and driving safety, and they can move things around. So if they're having a difficult time asking a question, they can move the car to illustrate what they're talking about. I attend local Rotary Club meetings on a regular basis so that I can connect with local employers and let them know about the potential employees that we are training in our classes. We use translation apps and also real people who can help translate concepts. So that's a community-based translator. Uh, local businesses have been very supportive and have worked with us and Job Search to provide placements for learners. On the job, employers continue to provide language and work skills support and can always come to us for advice. Next slide, please. We've been really lucky to have two successful participants that uh, I'm able to share about today. And I haven't used their real names, but I'll tell you a little bit about our learners that are very successful. 
Maria was sponsored by her husband and moved to Canada with very low English language skills. She was probably about a CLB 1-2 when she arrived. She found it very difficult to get a job for two reasons. First, because she lived outside of town and didn't have the language skills to pass her driver's exam to come to town for work. And two, she lacked the English language skills to find a job and succeed in an interview. We created a resume for her, yay for Google Translate, and did practice and mock job interviews and worked on oral communication skills in general. So during the mock interviews that we hosted as part of our class with a local employer, she was recruited and now works for that employer part-time in their pizza shop in the kitchen as a kitchen helper. She loves her job. She says she learns more English every day, and we suspect that she will soon have enough skills to gain a more skilled position. And our next learner, on the next slide, please. is Ahmed. Ahmed came to Canada with basically no English language skills. He was able to say, hello, my name is Ahmed, and that was about it for his level. He had previously worked in construction in his home country, but we were concerned that safety would be particularly difficult for him with the language barrier. We approached Job Search, our local work BC office, and explained his case, and they were willing to take him on temporarily. So with us in Job Search, we developed a resume for him using Google Images and Google Translate. So he and I sat in front of a computer, and I would Google different types of construction tools or construction techniques, and he would basically say yes, that one, or no, not that one. And then we would put the pictures into his resume and created sort of a picture portfolio of his skill set, and that went with him over to Job Search. We had a translator who was a community translator come in to discuss his resume once it was completed so that we were sure we weren't misrepresenting anything. We have used the manipulatives with him, uh, particularly for driving, and Google Apps to help him with his driver's license, and he did pass the written portion of his exam. He needs to pass the actual driving test, and we are very hopeful that he'll have his license right away, and he's only been in Canada for eight months, so it's a real success for him on that front. He did manage to get an employer with job search, and the employer that took him on for a short-term contract recently renewed this contract for another six months and continues to support his language and skill development. We look forward to his continued workplace success. And last slide, please. Carol and I would like to thank everyone for participating today and to AMSA for hosting. We are going to stick around here for some questions later on, if you have any that you'd like to ask us. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Katie and Carol, for your presentation and highlighting the importance of incorporating essential skills and employment language training for low-level learners. If you have any questions for our presenters, please email, tweet, or use the question box in your webinar window to send them to us. We'll have a 20 to 30 minute Q&A section at the end of our presentations to address those for you. Our next speaker for today is Brian Campbell. Brian Campbell has worked at the BC Fed Health and Safety Centre for seven years. In that time, he has trained thousands of Joint Health and Safety Committee members, as well as overseeing the English as an Additional Language and Migrant Worker portfolios. Originally from Brandon, Manitoba, Brian has been a proud member of the United Steel Workers for a very long time and worked for the Manitoba Federation of Labor and Safe Workers of Tomorrow for coming, before coming to the West Coast. Brian will introduce us to the BC Fed Health and Safety Centre, review some barriers faced by new Canadians and migrant workers in the workplace, and give us an overview of the programs of the BC Fed OH and SC directed at new Canadians. So take it away, Brian. All right, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, thank you for a very nice introduction there. And uh, specifically, thank you to Katie and Carol for an excellent and very informative presentation there. I was making lots of notes and not paying attention to what I was supposed to be doing myself. So uh, that means it was real good. So um, 
thank you uh, to, to ABSA for organizing this and, and to Jennifer uh, specifically. I am um, speaking on behalf, uh, obviously, of our organization today. And uh, I give regards from uh, Sheila Moyer, who is currently our staff member in charge of our English as Additional Language training. Uh, she is uh, indisposed today. Uh, our facilitators as well, Emily Hunter and uh, Anthony Fawcett, uh, who they do the full-time job of you know, uh, supplying the uh, in-classroom sessions. Uh, and I give regards uh, from our president, Irene Lanzinger, and um, our, our half million members across the province as well, many of who are probably listening uh, to this presentation here right now. So it is an absolute honor and privilege to be able to share and discuss some of the things that we found successful uh, in, in um, education around health and safety with early language uh, or um, uh, low language uh, level learners here. So we'll go to the next slide if that's okay. And just to give some context, the British Columbia Federation of Labor, uh, we represent all the different unions in the province of BC. We've been around for over 100 years advocating for the embitterment of working conditions uh, for everybody, not just union members. And, um, you know, we've uh, um, got campaigns around a $15 minimum wage, we call it the $15 Now campaign, uh, campaigns around $10 uh, a day universal child care, campaigns regarding occupational health and safety as well. Um, we, you know, uh, are an organization that uh, is very proud of the work that we do. And um, if anybody's interested, I strongly encourage you to, um, you know, uh, go to our website, look at some of those different campaigns that we do, and uh, look at some of the services that we can provide as well. Next slide, please. So the real sort of um, point of our discussion today is to talk and discuss the Health and Safety Center and some of the uh, programs that we have with the Health and Safety Center. So to give some historical context, back in 1999, there was a pretty significant change to the Workers' Compensation Act of British Columbia that uh, stipulated that when you're on a joint health and safety committee, and for everybody's um, knowledge here. If you have 20 people, either full or part-time, in your workplace, it's legally necessitated that you have to have a joint health and safety committee. Uh, but now, in 1999, we've had joint health and safety committees uh, actually since 1922 uh, in, in legislation, but it was only in 1999 uh, that it provided for an educational um, entitlement to joint health and safety committee members. So with that small legislative change, it was really the impetus for the creation of the BC Fed Health and Safety Center. And through the gracious donations of the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, who you know uh, changed their name to WorkSafe BC in 2004. So you'll probably hear me use those two um, names interchangeably, but it's the same organization, WorkSafe BC or the Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, we started providing health and safety education uh, specifically to committee members. Now, from there, we were able to expand uh, into providing for young workers, migrant workers, English language learners, supervisors, uh, and a whole bunch of other people that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about as well. On the top of the PowerPoint slide there, just uh, for, for everybody's interest, there's um, our general email address, uh, ohsadmin at bcfed.ca, uh, our website that a lot of the uh, write-up of the things that we'll be discussing uh, in this portion of the presentation are there, our Facebook group, which is BC Fed um, Health and Safety Center as well, and apparently we're on LinkedIn. I don't know really what we do on LinkedIn, but we're on there, just, you know, if you are as well. We'd, we'd love to be your friend. Um, so it's got our vision and mission statement here, and it says to provide education and resources necessary to participate uh, in health and safety in the workplace to prevent injury, illness, disease, and death. And there's a couple of really optimal words there, uh, specifically to be able to participate. Uh, and, you know, when you do have barriers, barriers being, you know, uh, lower language levels, um, uh, numeracy, literacy, uh, all that sort of stuff, we can uh, try 
and ensure that we, we remove some of those through these, these programs here. And you can see on the map, we are truly a provincial organization. We go to all of these different beautiful places such as Dawson Creek and Kitimat and Fort St. John and Dees Lake and Fort Nelson. I'm sitting in beautiful uh, Prince George right now. Uh, and uh, we just love every nook and cranny of this province. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And with just about every different um, public education thing we do, we try and put things into context with people because a lot of people don't understand uh, how prevalent workplace injury, illness, disease, and death are. Uh, across British Columbia and across Canada as well. So to give you a global context, 2.2 million people are killed uh, in workplace fatalities every year around the planet. Okay, That's a worker killed every 16 seconds. And though that's an estimation by the ILO, the International Labor Organization of the United Nations. Canada as a country is probably the most dangerous country to live and work in per capita, so for every 1,000 people that we have in our workforce, uh, we have the most people getting hurt, injured, and killed uh, for what we call the most economically developed countries in the world, the G7 countries, so that's France, Britain, Germany, Spain, the US, Australia, Italy, and a lot of that has to do with our types of industry. Obviously, resource extraction is uh, really um, a, a big part of our economy. Uh, forestry, mining, construction, agriculture, transportation. And here in the beautiful province of British Columbia, we have all of that. And you can see here that we're going in the wrong way. We're, we're, we're definitely trending in the wrong way. And a lot of that has to do with uh, occupational diseases that people uh, get from, from their work. And there's a, there's a great number of underreporting with that as well. But, you know, something to think about is, you know, by the end of today, on average, four workers will be killed uh, across Canada. And that's absolutely unacceptable. And part of our organization's mandate is to raise the public consciousness about this and to, uh, you know, try and stem this and, and change it and to say that that is unacceptable uh, and everybody deserves to go to work and come back with both their physical and their mental health uh, at the end of the day here. So April 28th is the National Day of Mourning. That started here in Canada. It's actually recognized by over 100 different countries now around the world as a day to reflect on workers who have been hurt, killed, and injured on the job. And that artwork, that beautiful, beautiful artwork there is called the Crying Moon. And that was done by our friend Bert Namos. And it symbolically represents the impact that a workplace injury, illness, disease or death uh, can have. And I'm sure that all everybody listening can, can appreciate when you think about your friends, your family, your neighbors, your community, you know people who have been hurt. You may have been hurt yourself. You know people who have been uh, severely hurt or, or, or even killed, and, it, and it's far too common. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And this is our brand new sort of infographic that explains all the different parts of the BC Fed Health and Safety Center uh, and the programs that we do. So starting right at the top there at uh, high noon, 12 o'clock, it, it's the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Committee Education. And this is really our, our big impetus. And uh, as many people know, uh, there's a legal change, uh, legislative change, I should say, coming uh, very soon in 2017 that's uh, going to just reaffirm the need for Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committee education uh, and, and enshrine that. So right now we, we probably train in eight-hour courses about 6,000 uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee members, and quite often uh, those participants uh, will, you know, have some literacy challenges in and of themselves. And we specifically uh, try and use clear language and, um, you know, uh, participatory education, which all union uh, health and safety education is kind of based on. But the idea that a lot of people haven't been in a classroom or, you know, uh, or have never really been in a traditional education uh, setting and as such, uh, we need to, to employ other learning methods to ensure that they get those, those learning outcomes. There's the supervisor health and safety uh, responsibilities, and anybody uh, who is in charge of other workers uh, needs to know the uh, due diligence and legal obligations that they have to ensure the safety of those people in which they instruct their work. Improving work to, uh, return to work outcomes, so this is um, uh, kind of a new 
area for ourselves, but getting injured people back into the workplace with inside of their functional limitations, but also, uh, you know, doing meaningful work. Um, our mental health, so building psychologically healthy workplaces. Um, we have a whole uh, education stream around bullying and harassment, stress in the workplace, accommodating mental issues, uh, and you can just look that up on our website. At the bottom here, English as Additional Language uh, Health and Safety Training, that's the, the program that we're going to really key in on, uh, but also our Migrant Worker Program. And there's over 70,000 uh, people under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program in the province of British Columbia right now. There's also over 10,000 uh, approximately who come to do agricultural work, so the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program as well. And we have a specific program for them to empower them to their health and safety rights, responsibilities, reporting of injuries, uh, and the legal protections that they have. The last two just to discuss just really quickly here, our employment program and our young worker program uh, go hand in hand. The employment program is for anybody who falls outside of the traditional uh, occupational, or, or pardon me, uh, learning um, structure. So they're, they're not in you know traditional high schools and stuff like that. And a lot of research has shown that uh, people who are not in the traditional education system are the ones doing quite often the most dangerous work, um, you know, uh, quite often they're working under the table or doing cash jobs uh, as well and being put in some very precarious situations. And then that last program, our, our Young Worker program, talks to about 30,000 high school students across the province. We take young union members to train, uh, they're usually under 30, so they really have a strong connection uh, and they appear to be a cooler older sister and brother to the um, students and as such the message uh, really kind of resonates and has a lot more impact there as well. So those are all the different parts of our one organization, the uh, BC Fed Health and Safety Center. We'll go to the next slide please. And I think that everyone who is listening can appreciate that uh, new Canadians and migrant workers specifically are quite often uh, the most you know marginalized and exploited uh, segments of our of our workforce right they're doing quite often really dirty dangerous jobs uh, and they're they're not in, even in compliance with the legal minimum under employment standards labor law or an especially occupational health and safety I've been regaled with hundreds of horrific stories that I think anybody would uh, kind of say, how could this happen uh, here in our province or, or in Canada? And uh, it's, it's, it's all too commonplace, unfortunately. So there's just a couple bullet points here I want to talk about uh, in, in, in regards to these barriers and how our programs can help uh, overcome these barriers. Um, the, the literacy, obviously, is really important, especially when you are looking at safe work procedures uh, that are a mandated part of every job. So how do I do this job safely in the specific uh, job steps? The comprehension and communication skills, you know, a lot of our safety training, unfortunately, uh, has, has been put online. So people sit there and click a computer and uh, it doesn't necessarily ensure that they are getting that critical information to keep themselves safe. Um, the bullet point uh, in the middle, voice, this one's really important. People need to be empowered to be able to speak up uh, and to ask questions, most importantly. That's the most important thing about health and safety, is being able to, um, you know, ask questions when you don't feel comfortable with something or that you think something could potentially hurt you in the workplace. Um, obviously, we've seen a, a great amount of underemployment of people who are uh, new to the Canadian economy here. And then the last part about um, the, the geographical and social isolation, especially I, I, in my personal view, in the lower mainland there, we have a lot of people who want to be around other people just like them. So they all speak in the same language group, um, you know, uh, have a lot of the same uh, cultural traits and habits and, and, and food customs and everything like that. And one of the great things about our uh, English language learner program is that it breaks people out of these bubbles. We've had participants 
who have lived um, in in the lower mainland for decades uh, and never really uh, gotten out of that sort of uh, language bubble that they that they live in. Their families uh, all speak, you know, that first language in the house. Their friends, their their cultural group, and everything. And they want to embedder themselves. They want to truly. Um, you know, get out and and uh, be able to participate more fully and functionally uh, in in that society. So, you know, we've had former uh, participants of our program who've gone on to be health and safety professionals, and uh, just about all of them have gone on to participate in health and safety in their workplace, predominantly becoming joint health and safety uh, committee members. So, we'll go to the next slide, please. And the next slide here is just reiterating, you know, some of the uh, information that was uh, in uh, Katie and Carol's uh, presentation about the the real need. Uh, and this study is entitled uh, "What You Don't What You Don't Know Can Hurt You." And um, as we know, occupational health and safety training is mandated and imperative in the province of British Columbia. If you uh, look at section 3.23 of our regulations, it actually lays out 13 different things that you must be trained on when you start a job. And just anecdotally, you know, we talk to our participants when they start the class and, and just about everybody is working and we ask, you know, have you been trained on emergency preparedness? Have you been trained on working alone, violence prevention, personal protective equipment? And resoundingly, no. Is, is the answer uh, and uh, it's it's quite interesting that uh, afterwards quite quite often people will go back into their workplaces and and start asking about some of these things and um, the employer has no problem to uh, provide that education and training which we think is a, is a great thing um, it's interesting here where it says employers spent 10 percent of their training budgets on occupational health and safety training Absolutely, because why? It's legally mandated. But only 2% of the budgets of organizational training went to literacy and basic skills upgrading. That's sort of what we call human capital investment. Uh, and as such, um, you know, this report showed that more than 4 in 10 Canadians in the working age population do not have the literacy skills needed to perform most jobs well. And I guess that's a bit of a subjective interpretation. But health and safety... Uh, in general has been struggling to get around this and I want you to start thinking about how does health and safety do that? Well health and safety tries to convey all information universally. So if you think about WIMIS, the Workplace Hazardous Materials Information System, um, it's all pictures, pictographs, classifications and divisions and the idea and especially with the augmentations that we've had um, since 2015 with the Global Harmonization System, uh, you should be able, once you understand the pictures and those numbers, exactly what that hazard is that's in front of you. Think about fire extinguishers, right? Fire extinguishers, if you pick one up, sure, it's got English, it's got French as our language laws um, dictate, but it's also got, um, you know, a picture picture to tell you exactly how to utilize that. Same thing with uh, emergency procedures and plans and everything that is essential health and safety information should be conveyed in a universal way because even if English is your first language, it doesn't mean um, you know that you have great literacy skills or that you understand um, what is trying to be uh, conveyed to you. We'll go to the next slide here. And historically, just uh, some of our, our, our different stakeholders, we have 59 different affiliated unions representing every different facet of the economy. I myself, as was mentioned, was a member of the United Steel Workers, but um, you know, all of our healthcare unions, all of our uh, retail uh, unions, everybody uh, has has challenges about um, getting you know people empowered around health and safety. Some of our different community partners that we've had great success with, Mosaic, uh, and we've done a construction for English language learners uh, program. Diversity, who we've partnered with to actually run a couple of, of our uh, intake sessions in Surrey at their place and at the beautiful new Surrey Library. Uh, success, PICS, a lot of the post-secondary institutions such as BCIT, Douglas College, uh, they all have you know uh, English language learners course as well that we'll come in and speak to about occupational health safety, program partners, Blade Runners, Springboard, Pathways, and I wanted to specifically uh, give an acknowledgement to Collingwood Neighborhood House, which is right down the street from us uh, on Joyce, 
in East Vancouver, and then the Richmond Multicultural Community Services as well, who we're partnering with uh, to do an intake of our English as additional language uh, training. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And the next slide here shows the four programs that talk to people with low literacy um, levels specifically. So to start with what we call a Live After Five, our young worker program, quite often our facilitators will go into classrooms where, you know, the students themselves are refugees are coming in with a benchmark one and two and you need to be able to convey some of this information so we actually have a student resource book that you can access online off of our website 18 pages done in clear language tons of pictures but our presentations are done in a participatory way quite often with personal protective equipment or safety equipment uh, to try and recognize the hazard and show how to protect uh, those young workers there. Our migrant worker program that I was talking about, uh, we have um, Spanish facilitators who go out predominantly on Sundays and we will talk to people who harvest all that food that you have on your table there. And it's amazing sort of the, um, the number of workers that you don't see uh, that are part of uh, that uh, faction of the economy there who predominantly come from Mexico, Guatemala, um, and uh, some of the Caribbean countries and come and do some very hard intensive work uh, you know they're they're living on the farms they're in sort of again this you know uh, bubble and uh, we try and get them exposed to what are their rights um, how to you know report injuries uh, and and hopefully you know how to be empowered a little bit around um, health and safety new uh, worker awareness or employment program again uh, we partner with many different uh, community service providers providers and uh, post-secondary institutions and then uh, our focus for today our ESL for occupational health and safety and I know that it's a bit of a contentious point uh, to refer to to a program as ESL but we actually found um, we get the best uh, uptake when we when we promote and do outreach for new participants people recognize the the ESL uh, acronym as opposed to English language learner, English as additional language, which is probably a more apt and correct term to uh, be employing. We'll go to the next slide, please. And on the next slide here, this is actually just a, a couple pictures uh, from some of our different intake uh, classes. And the one thing uh, that I can say is that we are a virtual United Nations of, of participants who come to our free, uh, you know, 12-week program. Uh, we have had participants from, and this is just the last intake session uh, that we had, and I wanted to, to read this out for everybody here, if I can find where I put that. Pardon me, uh, we have uh, people from Hong Kong, South Korea, the Philippines, the Ukraine, India, Guatemala, Taiwan, Bangladesh, China, Brazil, and we had a really big group of people who came from Indonesia, uh, from, from Aceh, which I believe is from the island of Sumatra, which was uh, devastated with that tsunami. So uh, they came as a large group uh, in uh, to our program, uh, and everybody is just uh, wonderful. And friendships are made for life. Uh, I'm still Facebook friends with people I met through this program, you know, seven years ago now. Uh, and uh, I can truly say that this is, you know, um, a big thing in a lot of people's lives and a great accomplishment uh, that they've achieved once they've gone through this program. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So what is our ESL for Health and Safety program exactly? It touches on all nine of the essential skills. Uh, it's free. It's free and it's free, uh, just to underline that point, through the gracious donations from WorkSafe BC. Uh, participants learn English language skills uh, and through learning health and safety. So you're learning health and safety content and curriculum, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, really sharpening and, and honing those, those skills of numeracy, literacy, uh, conversation, everything there. There's a great graduation ceremony and a dinner that we have at the completion of the 12 weeks and um, you know I've, I've 
just joy, absolute joy to see people so happy and a feeling of great accomplishment for them and their families. Um, as I previously mentioned, lots of past participants have gone on uh, to be very active in, in health and safety in their workplace and in a professional level. And right now, uh, we're doing about 100 participants per year. And you think, well, that's that's kind of small beans, right? You're only doing 100 people. But this, these are people who are giving up you know, two nights a week or four hours uh, a week, and um, it's a 12-week program. So that's actually a lot of facilitated time. And if we transition to the uh, next slide, I just wanted to also mention we're going to start rolling out a level two for this program. So if you know anybody who has participated in our previous program, we have a, a level two that's going to start up in the fall uh, for people because there's been such demand for people to come back. So I'm running out of time, but I want to go through the content and the curriculum here that we have laid out. So the most imperative thing, the rights and the responsibilities, the right to know, the right to participate, right to refuse unsafe work, right to no discrimination, but also what are your responsibilities when you are a worker, a supervisor or an employer in the workplace. What is WorkSafe BC? It does compensation, it does prevention, but a lot of people are kind of mystified to it as an organization. So we actually have representatives um, come in, Robin and Helen, who just do a fantastic presentation and answer everybody's questions as well. We talk about hazard identification for people because they might not necessarily know about the things that they're working with that could be dangerous. Personal protective equipment, how to use it, how to clean it, how to store it properly, all the different parts that are on it. Um, we have an entire uh, session on the right to refuse unsafe work uh, because this is a very important thing. It can save lives, but it has to be done properly and it has to be done in the right um, chronological order uh, as well. All right. Um, I uh, heard the colleagues from uh, Dawson Creek talking about uh, doing first aid training. We do CPR training, and it's one of the highlights of our uh, course. And people really feel empowered, you know, after they they come out of that as well. Um, incidents, how to report injuries and and incidents uh, in your workplace. Next slide, please. Uh, we look at uh, WIMIS, which is our chemical safety program, uh, ergonomics, so uh, a majority of workplace injuries are actually soft tissue injuries, joints, ligaments, uh, aches, sprains and strains, all that sort of stuff. So how do we prevent those in our workplace? Bullying and harassment, and especially new Canadians and English language learners are susceptible targets uh, to bullying and harassment in the workplace. Uh, so how do you have those conversations? It's very difficult sometimes, uh, but it's also really important uh, that we protect people's mental health, uh, especially the most marginalized and exploited in our, in our economy. Employment standards deals with uh, how much you should be getting paid, uh, your protections in the workplace. If you don't have a union, um, health and safety committees, their imperative role in uh, fixing internal problems identifying hazards and, and implementing those solutions, unions and their roles in the workplace and with health and safety, and then uh, applying for jobs is one of the last uh, modules and, and parts of the curriculum that we do where um, much as the colleagues uh, Dawson Creek, we do some role playing uh, and we get people to ask questions about safety um, when they're applying for jobs, which should be a really good idea because employers want to hire people who understand safety and its importance. Next slide please. And this slide here is pictures from our graduation dinner. Um, the um, picture on the left there, uh, you see um, uh, Emily who is uh, one of our facilitators who's been with us for about three or four years now and a real key uh, part of our success. She, she flowers and chocolates all the time. People just absolutely love her. But the fellow standing on the left, that's actually his mom um, over on the, on the far right there. And he came in and got her signed up, and, and that is his uh, partner or wife, I'm pretty sure, um, standing next to his mom there. And they all came to the class together. She literally could say her name. Um, you know, so she was she was a, um, a benchmark one, and through this program, she was able to really improve 
so many different facets of her, um, you know, English language comprehension and writing and numeracy, and uh, it was just a beautiful thing to see that generational, um, you know, learning experience there. Uh, you can see on the right-hand picture here, uh, our president Irene uh, came to the uh, graduation ceremony with this last intake group here, and. We usually try and cap it around 30 participants, and there's sometimes there's attrition just because a lot of people have challenges with childcare and just about everybody's working too. So as you know, working an 8, 10, 12 hour day and then going to, to school, it, it's, it's a tough go. But we, we have a discussion about commitment at the start of the intake of the program, and most people see it right through until the end. Next slide, please. This is just a promotional slide here for our uh, upcoming free uh, course. Oh, actually, this one started in October. Never mind. I'm going to speak to this one in a couple of uh, weeks, actually. And, you know, we're, don't judge us by our advertisements or our outreach here because this isn't uh, uh, necessarily the best stuff. Um, but, you know, we put these... Um, on uh, street pools, we give them out to our friends at Mosaic at Diversity at all different uh, libraries and programs as well and try and get people uh, to come and to register. They can register by phoning us, they can register online or even just walking into our office uh, at uh, the right by the Joyce SkyTrain station there. Next slide please. Uh, just wrapping up here, my friends, uh, if anybody is interested in um, any of the programs that we talked about with the BC Fed Health and Safety Center, uh, you can look us up online there, uh, and our website should have a good write-up and synopsis overview of all the different content and curriculum and um, all the different geographic areas. Unfortunately, our ESL program is only uh, in the lower mainland right now. So we ran it in Vancouver, Surrey, and Richmond. Uh, and hopefully, uh, through our you know continued success, we'll be able to get this into other geographic regions. So if you're interested, I strongly encourage you to reach out and talk to us, and we can see what we can do. Last slide, please. And the last slide here is just a screenshot of our website. Uh, again, there's the drop down for all the different classroom materials, uh, but our mandate is to provide health and safety education and information uh, to everybody throughout the province of British Columbia. So let us know how we can help with that, and uh, we would we would uh, be just uh, tickled pink uh, to hear from you. You know, uh, it's it's interesting that um, health and safety usually only becomes a real prominent thought after something bad happens. And we want to ensure that you know uh, people don't get hurt, killed, and injured, uh, that on April 28th, the day of mourning, maybe some year, we'll have gone a year without any fatalities here in the province of British Columbia. And that's what we're kind of working and striving towards. So thank you uh, to Jennifer, to Ansa, to uh, our, our uh, participants here. And uh, that's all that I got for right now anyway. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Brian, for that presentation on health and safety training and sharing so much valuable information on what we can focus on with our low-level English students. So now is the time to answer some questions. Uh, you can type your questions into the chat box. I'm monitoring that. You can email them to us at, at events, events at, at amsa.org. And you can also submit them by Twitter. Uh, so I'm going to start with some easy ones uh, for you, Brian. Um, are there any requirements for the ESL Occupation Health and Safety course, such as minimum CLBs, PR status, or age? No, no, and no. Uh, we, at one point, tried to um, kind of encourage people to at least have um, uh, CLB of about three, but I mean, how do you, we, we, you, you don't know that, right? And uh, what we found is that people uh, very quickly um, will, will decide themselves once we get into the classroom um, if, if this is uh, going to work for them or not. And we 
never discourage anybody uh, from participating. Uh, and one of the things that really helps is having a good group of people with you who might have your um, same first language skills. Uh, so we've seen some great success with that, where if you're in a group uh, who, you know, is, is, is from Brazil and you have somebody who can, you know, translate those terms or concepts that you don't know, uh, that can work really well. And we've seen a lot of great success with that. Um, there's no requirement for permanent residency. We've had a lot of people who actually come into the temporary foreign worker program, uh, participate in our program, and age. We, in the last intake, had a 16-year-old and we had a 69-year-old. Uh, and believe it or both, not, both are working. Uh, and as such, uh, that's really the only requirement is that you are working or you're looking for work. Okay, thank you. And now um, I have another question for you, Brian. Um, how do organizations get you or someone like you as a guest speaker? Uh, super, super easy. You can go to our website and just uh, there's an online booking form for our Live After Five and our employment program. You can reach out directly uh, to us as well and just give us a heads up uh, who your organization is, what sort of your, your needs are. Um, but our free 12-week program, um, you know, as I had said, uh, right now we're only uh, running intakes in the lower mainland, and we know that there's great demand in all other parts of the province as well, but we can have uh, many different uh, skilled trained facilitators come and speak to just about any group, and we'll find a place for it to fit under in one of our programs, either the Alive After Five, the Employment Program, our Migrant Worker Program, or ESL program. Okay, thanks Brian. And now I think I'm going to move on to probably my favorite set of questions about materials. Uh, so first, Katie and Carol, you mentioned you use Google Apps. Can you please explain more about this? Um, okay, so I found um, there's the, the Google Translate app, right? So you can go into Google and get the translation. And there's a couple of other apps. I'm just going to pull them up. Uh, one that I have is called Word Ref, and it's for English to Spanish. That's one that I have on my phone right here. Um, we have also, if you actually Google the Google app for um, ICBC in Arabic, there are some questions in there so that people can practice their driver's test in Arabic. That's one of the big things we've found is um, Translation of the driver's manual. I believe it only exists in Chinese and I want to say Punjabi and it was privately translated by cultural organizations down there. Um, but the Google um, uh, app for ICBC in Arabic does live online and you just have to Google it and download it onto your Google device or your Android device. Okay, that's really handy. Um, and then I have another question for you, Carol and Katie. You showed us some beautiful first aid materials. Uh, would you be willing to share those? Sorry, Carol's talking, but her mic's not on. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm unmuted now. Sorry. Um, so um, we just ordered in those first aid kits just from our local safety um, store here and uh, then everything else basically I just you know I just basically kind of printed pictures out and just laminated them and just cut them up into sort of you know card sizes and that's kind of what I use in the classroom so it wasn't anything specific that I you know kind of literally kind of ordered offline it was just something that we had just ordered so um, I can I mean I can certainly send the uh, send the the, the uh, sort of pictures to you to be laminated and to just need to be cut into cards if anyone is interested, so that's for sure. Oh yeah, or you could share them on Tutela as well. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay, and then Brian, I have some questions about materials from your organization. So um, can organizations purchase or download the course materials and deliver the program themselves? Yeah, actually one of the things that we did was uh, partner up with Dakota um, Literacy Association and uh, developed a content and curriculum package that was called Building Resilient Workers. This was rolled out at their last conference 
and um, it was a set of books, uh, and I believe Dakota even gave a stipend to the different organizations uh, to go and roll this out, and the contingency was that you had to do um, sort of an intake survey and then a outcome survey as well to try and show the marginal change in um, people's expectations around health and safety after they would completed uh, the content and the curriculum. Now that doesn't match up exactly with our 12-week program, but it's got a lot of the real highlights to it. And um, you know, again, if people are interested, I I I'd encourage you to um, contact Dakota uh, about uh, getting a copy of the facilitator guide and all the classroom materials on that as well. The one thing I wanted to mention, though, Jennifer, and I. Um, I'm remiss that I, I forgot to mention this, but WorkSafe BC is a world-class leader in providing um, health and safety education and materials in all different languages. Um, and uh, if you go to their website, uh, they have a new website that's just been launched to fully beta tested, uh, but great stuff. So if you have a specific group of, of language learners and you really want them to understand about uh, confined space, lockout, tagout, violence prevention, um, safe work procedures, whatever it could be, they have um, um, specific materials on that. Oh, great. And um, Katie, I'm going to field this one back to you. You mentioned that you use some websites to help make learner plans. Uh, could you share with us some of those websites? Uh, to make the learner plans, <clears throat> actually all of those resources to make our learner plans um, the actual like, content comes from Douglas College through their essential skills program. We use a template that we've modified from them for our use. But if you're talking about the actual like assessment tools that we use, it would be under uh, whatever HRSDC is now, ESDC I suppose. Um, and I can share that on Tutela as well so that people have access to that, but we use that. And then there's a literacy, I'll, I'm going to just share it instead of trying to remember everything. I'll share it on Tutela. Great, yeah. We'll have to start a little Tutela group. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a harder question. Um, and it can first go to Katie and Carol and then maybe to Brian. Um, can you give us some more information about models that um, are present? that employers are using to support language learning in the workplace, especially for low-level learners? Um, okay, so I'll specifically speak to the woman who's working um, in the pizza shop there. So luckily the employer was also an immigrant and she understands that um, our employee there has like what it's like to be a second language learner. So in the workplace, she will have things like um, to work with her one-on-one -on -one to actually physically like demonstrate the safety things. So this is what we do, this is what we don't do, and she'll model them with her like going into the kitchen and kind of walking her through things. And she just makes sure that um, when she's working, she's not by herself in the back for the first little while. And she had a two or three week training process where they went through all of the materials and use, again, like translation if necessary. So that's kind of, I guess that's maybe not a very detailed um, answer, but that's what they're doing in that workplace. Okay. And Brian, do you have anything to add there? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tough question, but uh, during our program's infancy, we did go and work with specific affiliated unions that represented workplaces. So I'm not going to say that it was by any means the initiative of the workplace, but the, um, the union themselves saw a dire need uh, for their members to, you know, be empowered to English language learning and to uh, health and safety. So, uh, specifically, healthcare, retail, um, and transportation industries, we have uh, gone in and done pretty much specific uh, workplace training on that and hazard recognition, doing risk assessments, um, putting in con controls, and then setting up their joint health and safety committee uh, as well. And that's initiated by employers. Nope, by the union. Oh. Okay, and um, for Katie and Carol, 
Uh, you mentioned that you provide one-on-one -on -one support and you sometimes have volunteers in the classroom. Um, what kind of training do you provide your volunteers? Um, <laughs> I wish I had a better answer for this, but our volunteers are people that have, because it's such a small organization, I mean, they've originally at some point taken, I believe it was LSAT that offered that handbook for the volunteer training. So they would have taken that most of them many years ago. And then what we do if we have somebody that comes in that's new to the program, we'll sit down with them, go over things like confidentiality, privacy, that sort of thing. And then we will, uh, for my program, I'll show them like specific resources that we use and some teaching strategies if they're going to be in the classroom with us. So we do a little, it's all one-on-one -on -one, um, at this point. And then in some cases it's, um, like I said, people who've already taken that training years ago because we've been in the, in, the, in the community for many, many years. So they have taken the LSAT program. And I don't know if that's still available online for people to use in their office, but it is quite useful. Okay. And if I could just add to this, um, I'm actually going to have um, somebody from the community next week in my class. So on a Tuesday, I actually teach uh, work skills for e to ESL learners. So next week, I'm actually going to have um, one of my other students from one of my other evenings come in and just talk about what it's like to work in um, with an employer in Canada in our community. Like some of the areas were difficult for her when she started out. Um, she's, you know, her language is very good now. But um, and just kind of a question and answer period, so some of my learners can ask her sort of some of the areas that she struggles. Um, she does work in one of our local Tim Horton stores, so it's you know it'll be good for them to be able to ask her questions, and it's also good for me to learn some of the the areas I guess that that pop up, and that kind of goes back to sort of Brian's slide here about the difficulties that are that's going on out there in with our employers and our organisations that sometimes we don't know that are actually happening. So that's actually a volunteer I'm going to have next week in my in my classroom as well. So. Okay. Um, so, Brian, uh, do you have a train the trainer model as part of your organization? And that means that you would go in and train instructors on how to talk about health and safety with their students. Uh, we do for our uh, young worker program. Uh, we have about 60 people currently on the books who are our trained facilitators, and some of them uh, specialize in. ESL uh, classrooms and uh, I talked about some of the challenges uh, that can come from there and the different you know learning tactics that have to be employed uh, as well so um, you know a lot of our um, facilitators are uh, relatively new Canadians themselves we have one who uh, has only been here for four years came uh, as a single mom and um, spoke no uh, English came into our program and now she's uh, one of our facilitators as well. Our facilitators for the 12-week uh, program uh, both have uh, several um, academic designations, Masters and TESOL and ELSA and all that stuff that I apologize I'm not super familiar with, uh, but um, they are our, our, our go-to skilled people when we look at our content and curriculum and developing that. But for our other uh, programs that just go in and do like a uh, half hour, hour, two hour presentations, yeah, we actually do have a train the trainer model uh, specifically for that and talking about some of the uh, barriers that uh, need to be recognized and um, uh, you know how to overcome those. Mm, yeah, that would be great PD for an organization. Um, I have a question and I'm actually going to let any one of you answer it. Uh, is there an example of the BC Fed 12-week course offered within a link program such as workplace language programs? So do any of you know if there are any um, settlement language programs that focus on workplace health and safety? Well, I know Mosaic does, you know, uh, English for the, the workplace uh, courses, and they have specific modules on occupational health and safety, but not a full uh, time, um, you know, uh, designation and focus on occupational health and safety per se. Okay. Katie and Carol? 
I actually, I don't know of any organization. I This is my first time learning about this too, so I <laughs> do have more material for our classes. Yeah, and Thank I mean, you. this is our opportunity to maybe develop things and use this information to further our own programs at our own organizations. Mm -hmm. For sure, yep. Okay, and um, I have a little bit of a tricky question for you, and you may take some time to answer it, but um, if an organization were to start a workplace program tomorrow, what would be the top two or three things you would say that they absolutely need to cover in their curriculum? So I'll first start with Brian. Well, hey, I mean, uh, you're, you're, you're talking to uh, Mr. Union over here, so uh, obviously I think uh, occupational health and safety, uh, employment standards, so what are those legal minimums that have to be uh, given in the workplace, and, um, you know, uh, also hopefully uh, a little bit of, you know, uh, focus on um, uh, communication uh, and and the different uh, channels, forms of communication in in the workplace, and um, yeah, some of the uh, sort of uh, exogenous opportunities that are out there uh, for advancement. Because one of the things uh, that we've seen from our program is that this really just opens people up to oh, I want to you know. Uh, do more learning. I want to go take more courses around occupational health and safety, or more courses uh, involving something that they're that they're interested in. And uh, you learn about these quite often by initially getting into a program. I always, you know, uh, try and empathize that the, the biggest day is is the first day to show up to something that you don't really know what you're getting into, uh, but it could truly be um, life changing for for a lot of people. That's for sure. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Um, I guess I would echo some of, of what Brian said. I would also add, we've actually talked about um, human rights workplace, which I guess might be similar there, so talking about grounds um, for discrimination, that sort of thing. And that discussion generally starts when we look at their resume, and so we'll ask them to bring in a resume that they might have from their home country, because that's sort of our starting point for the whole thing. Um, is making sure they have a resume. So I guess that would be one of the things. They have to have a resume and ideally a cover letter, although I know that's a real stretch for a lot of, um, of new learners. Um, but we talk about uh, taking a picture off of the resume, taking a personal information, that sort of thing. So I, I would add those two um, in, in a workplace language class too, for sure, as a priorities. Okay, and how about Carol? Um, well, I'm just doing the work safety um, course right now for ESL, and so I'm really, I think communication is a huge one, but, you know, basically it kind of goes back to what Katie and I and what we've talked about is really it's safety specific to occupation. So right now, you know, because restaurants and uh, housekeeping positions tend to be sort of quite the popular choice up here with uh, specific occupations, that's actually what I'm working on right now. So right now we are talking about specific personal protective equipment and accidents in, in the workplace under, under occupation. So that's kind of what we worked on today. So that's kind of where I'm going with my course at the moment. So um, that's why it was really interesting to hear from Brian today because, of course, we didn't know that this was going on. And, boy, I sure wish you didn't live so far away, Brian. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I have, sorry. I said free training up in Dawson Creek. <laughs> you betcha. We'll make it happen. Um, so I have one final question for the panel here. Um, what are the what is the biggest challenge that you face teaching these kinds of topics to your learners, and how have you have overcome that challenge? And I'll start with Katie. <laughs> the biggest the biggest challenge in this. Oh, I mean, I suppose it is that oral communication piece and yeah. just making sure that you're understanding, you're understanding them and they're understanding you. And that's where I feel like having multiple avenues of teaching, talking, and kind of showing these different things are really important. Uh, so for, like I used with the resume example, you have the, the pictures that you use with your students. And then you have that discussion piece. 
and then you bring in maybe a community translator, you use your translation app. So just having a, a multitude of resources available to make sure that the message is getting across um, and particularly with safety, I think having those visuals. Okay, Carol? Yeah, and I agree, communication. Um, as many visuals as I had, and I had a whole bunch today, you know, there were still words that they just did not have a, a clue of the understanding. Rung of a ladder, a perfect example today of trying to explain what that was. Thank goodness for Google, I'm telling you, because I go to that all the time. Um, and so basically it's, it is, it's the oral communication and just, you know, translating that word. The words that we, you know, take for granted every day, um, a rung of a ladder, but for, to try to explain that to someone again, you know, you have to have a ladder so you can show that. So what is a, does a rung of a, on a ladder look like? So basically it's definitely communication and uh, everything needs to be visual so that it's a lot easier to show something. So okay. that's for sure. It is the curriculum that we pick to, uh, to teach these courses. Great. And Brian? Yeah, I just I, I really wanted to echo uh, you know what's what's been contributed thus far. When we when we teach about personal protective equipment, I can show you a fall harness, a, a you know a helmet, steel toed boots, and stuff like that. But concepts around bullying and harassment, around mental health in the workplace. I mean, that's a little harder to convey quite often to low level uh, language learners, but it's just as important and, and if not more important, right? And quite often, I mean, we're talking about biological hazards to somebody who was a doctor where they come from, right? So it just, you know, once you can get that um, that breakthrough, whatever the means of that communication is, is really important. But um, to go back to the, um, the central question here, the, the, the biggest challenges, we had a real tough time um, getting an instructor who was proficient in uh, doing early language and health and safety. Um, usually somebody was really good uh, and had a whole bunch of designations in health and safety, uh, or they had a whole bunch of designations in, in you know, teaching English as additional language, but having both of those together was a really hard thing to find. And um, we got ourselves into a situation in which our one of our uh, facilitators just took off, and um, we had to literally reinvent the wheel uh, again, which, you know, was a really good learning process for us to not abdicate responsibility as an organization to a facilitator or any one instructor and ensure that we had content curriculum that anybody could come and t take and, and know how to deliver after that. And then I think that uh, everybody can appreciate uh, the, the challenge around funding. We've literally, as a nonprofit organization, had to you know, beg, borrow, and steal for, for some of the different resources and the things uh, to do, even though, you know, I got to say we are truly lucky and, and very um, grateful for, for our funding from WorkSafe BC, uh, but we want to do more. We, we, we continuously, you know, um, want to, you know, be expanding exponentially because we know that the demand is there uh, for this type of education and this, um, you know, the, these opportunities for people. Okay, great. That's three great pieces of advice from three great speakers. Thank you very much. And so to all those online, thank you very much for joining us today. We will be emailing everybody an online evaluation form. Please take the time to fill it out as AMSA relies on the feedback provided in the evaluations to plan future events and trainings. A special thank you to our speakers for giving us their time and expertise to help support the settlement and language sectors. Thank you very much to our wonderful AMSA team for supporting us during this webinar today. And we would like to thank Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for funding this event. We will be posting the presentations and resources on the AMSA website. You will sound out a notification on SETNET when they are posted. If you do not receive the weekly updates for SETNET, log on to our website and sign up. It's free to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye.